Um, this is installment number two of uh, this series of uh, sermons that is going to take us now all the way uh, through the, the Lent season. And uh, we're looking at this thing that we call the love of God or God's love or the idea that God is love. And I kicked this off last week with a couple of things that I wanted you to think about or to ponder uh, in maybe your, your prayer life or your spiritual disciplines. But I pointed out or I suggested to you that out of our human experience of love, we sometimes take that human experience of love and we project that humanness onto God. And that is a very normal and natural and sometimes very healthy thing for us to do, but it also sometimes can work against us a little bit. And to be aware of those downfalls, to be aware of that downside, is something that I think is important for us. Now that whole process is called creating an anthropomorphic image of God. And I apologized last week for that word, and I'll apologize again, but there just isn't another one that adequately describes what that process is. And so to project our humanness onto God, or project our humanness uh, onto the divine, is creating what is called an anthropomorphic image of God. Now, what I'd like for us to think about, though, is what that does to us in terms of kind of painting us into a corner. We sometimes struggle trying to reconcile our real world experience with this thing that we call God's love. And it brings up for us some really hard, really difficult questions. And once again, for how many times our world is rocked one more time by yet another mass school shooting. A disgruntled teenager wanders into a high school in Florida with an assault rifle, and all of a sudden, 17 people are dead. And it raises, you know, we, we can ask a lot of questions about that, but it raises some very difficult theological questions. Questions like, where is the love of God in that classroom when those students are being shot? Or how can God allow such a thing to take place? And it leads us in circles. We, we end up confused and sometimes dismayed and sometimes it challenges our faith because we simply do not know how to respond to those questions. Whether somebody else is asking those questions or we're asking those questions ourselves, we just don't know where to go. We don't know what to do with something like happened in Florida just a couple of days ago. Now I've said this last week, but what happens when we create this image of God that is like a human being, and we tend to think about human responses to those difficult questions that we ask, those responses tend to fall into a couple of categories. Category number one is God chooses to allow the suffering. God chooses to allow that disgruntled teenager to enter that school with his assault rifle and just go ahead and shoot those people. It's okay. Well, I'm not comfortable with that at all. Category number two is that God would like to eliminate the suffering. God would like to stop that shooter from going into the high school in Florida, but cannot. There's a limitation there. There's some reason that God cannot stop those speeding bullets from finding their targets. Neither one of these two options sits well with me. Neither one of these two options identifies the kind of God that I'm in relationship with. And so what you're left with is this need, this desire, to dig a little deeper, to find out for yourselves exactly what is entailed, what it means when we talk about the love of God. 
What is it? What's it look like? Where do we find it? How do we reconcile what happens in the real world with this thing that we call the love of God? And that's what this series is going to help us explore. Now I've decided that this concept of God's love is so huge, there's so many facets to it, that one of the ways to break it down into small, manageable pieces and to think about it piece by piece is to consider the word love as an acronym. And so we can look at each of the four letters of the word L-O-V-E and find words that maybe help us define or distinguish or gives us things to think about in terms of God's love. And so we're going to look at two of those words today. The first word is limitless. And you got a sense of that in the opening psalm that we read when we said and we repeated that God's love endures forever. The second word is luminous. So I want to consider this idea of God's love being limitless first. Now one of the things that I really like to do when I, I decide that I'm going to take some time, I'm going to go out and I'm going to shoot some pictures. And uh, this is, you know, my recreation. This is what I really appreciate doing. But some of the best times are with a waterfall. There's something about the water. There's something about a waterfall. There's just some kind of special mesmerizing, uh, I don't know, energy, spirit, uh, God's presence that is there at a waterfall. Now, I can't really explain this logically. I, I, can't, um, I can't give you the science behind what takes place. But when I am with a waterfall, and particularly if I'm all by myself, I'm alone there. There isn't anybody else. Often that happens you know, like very early in the morning or um, in the evening when the light is good. But if I'm there all by myself, I sometimes get this overwhelming feeling of gratitude. Like, you know, this show is being put on just for me. And I'm the only one there. And that this is somehow special. And I have an emotional response to that waterfall. It, it becomes personal. And I, I develop a personal connection with that waterfall. Now, this sounds crazy. Because what I'm doing is I'm projecting some human-like qualities onto that waterfall. <coughs> well, maybe that's okay. It's the only way that we as human beings know how to respond. But you see, I appreciate that natural beauty. And I appreciate it to the point where it moves me emotionally. I get moved by that presence or in the presence of that waterfall. I happen to think that that's a very healthy attitude. I happen to think that that's something that, you know, everybody would do well to go and find a waterfall and to stand in front of that waterfall until you're moved emotionally. That's good for you. That's good stuff. response to the waterfall. That much is clear. And we do the same thing with God. There is this thing that Christians identify as the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, particularly if you're with a group of people, and the, the preaching has been, you know, remarkably good, and there's some hymn that is your favorite hymn, and all of a sudden, you just have this emotional response. And you're moved emotionally at, at the moment. And you feel God's presence in an emotional way. And it's only natural and healthy, and that is a good experience. But then we take that same emotion and we project it onto God. Because we had an emotional response, we also think that God is also emotional. 
because we had an emotional response that is based in our humanness, we also think that God is human. So I want to get back to the waterfall for just a minute. I have that. I have an emotional response to that waterfall. When I'm there, present with the waterfall, taking pictures and, and being involved in that natural beauty and all of that. But what would happen if I got a little bit carried away and I started to think that, well, this waterfall isn't just human, it's superhuman. And it has powers. It has superpowers. And the waterfall can decide whether or not it's going to flow. The waterfall can decide if it's going to splash and get this rock wet and leave this rock dry. The waterfall begins to take on these human-like qualities. And then just for argument's sake, let's say that somewhere upstream, tragically, a, a toddler wanders into the river and gets caught up in the current and is swept over the edge of that waterfall and eventually drowns. Would anybody ever blame the waterfall for that? Would ever, anybody ever say, how could the waterfall allow that to happen? Can you imagine us posing those two questions that I mentioned earlier? Or those two answers, rather, that the waterfall chose to allow that toddler to be swept away and to drown. Or the waterfall would want to stop that drowning from taking place, but was powerless to do so. Would anybody in their right mind ever do such a thing? Of course not. A waterfall has no consciousness. The waterfall has no perception of good or bad. The waterfall has no emotion. And yet we do it to God all the time. All I mentioned the idea of God's love being limitless. And I wanted to get you thinking about this metaphor of God's love as a waterfall before we really dealt with this idea of God's love endures forever or the limitless nature of God's love. Because as I said earlier, sometimes when I'm there with a waterfall, I feel like this, you know, this drama is playing out just for me. You know, if I'm there by myself, it's like, this is just unbelievable. You know, where is everybody? Why is this happening right here for me, right now? And of course, the fact is that the waterfall flows all the time, whether you're there or not. Whether you're there with a whole bunch of people, or if there's nobody there, the waterfall flows the same way. Day after day after day, week after week, any time of day, any day of the week. Now, of course, sometimes the, the flow ebbs and flows a little bit based on the seasons. But generally, the waterfall flows year-round. You can get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go out to the waterfall, and there it would be flowing away. Right now, all of the famous waterfalls that you can think of. Niagara is booming away at this moment. Right now, it's doing it. Multnomah Falls, just close to Portland, you know, it's flowing away. Whether you're there or not, it's doing it. It's limitless. The water cycle is set up so that it just keeps recirculating. Those sources of water that feed that waterfall are constantly resupplied. And it goes and it goes and it goes and it goes and it has for centuries. It has for millennia. It is limitless in that way. It's also available. You can go see a waterfall anytime you want. You can go find one. You can be with it. You can have that personal connection with it. And in those ways, a waterfall is a great metaphor for the love of God because it is limitless, it's available, it's there, and it's constant. It's always there. But I mentioned another word that also begins with it all, and that is luminous. Now, if we were to define luminous 
I think most of us would say that it has something to do with light, or if something is luminous, it glows perhaps, or it gives off light. My interpretation of this idea, this luminous being a word that is associated with the love of God, is not in a literal sense, okay? We're, we're talking about the metaphorical implications of what it means to be luminous. But what this represents is also enlightenment or luminosity from a certain perspective. Now, I want you to think about this. Because if you think about the love of God in a certain perspective, in a certain way, if you can begin to move away from an anthropomorphic image of God that is so easy to set up, if you can finally get your mind around this idea that maybe to image God in another way is really a source of enlightenment. And if you can understand God's love in that perspective, all of a sudden, the light bulbs go on. And what happens is that you create an enlightened image of God. And when that happens, it relieves you of so many of those questions. Because when I pose the questions about the waterfall, how could the waterfall allow that toddler to be swept away over the edge of the ground? It seemed preposterous. It seemed preposterous. And when we do that with the love of God, it's equally as preposterous. It's just that we don't see it that way. And so what I'm suggesting is that we need to have this enlightenment. We need to have the luminosity of God's love help us to establish this spiritual foundation, this, this building up of an image of God that helps us to answer some of life's most difficult questions. Now there is a definite relationship between what we think, what we believe to be true, and what our actual experience is. There's, there is a, an undeniable relationship between those two things. Henry Ford is famous for having said things like, whether you believe that you can or you believe that you can't, you're right. Do you remember that? You know, Henry Ford said that. Now, in a little more modern context, one of, one of my favorite authors is Dr. Wayne Dyer, the, the now late Dr. Wayne Dyer. But he had a favorite saying, and he used to say that if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Now, I, that is absolute true. That is an absolutely true statement. If you change the way you look at things, <coughs> the things you look at change. In other words, if you believe one thing over here and you change that belief, your physical experience will be different than it once was. What you believe to be true alters your reality. And if you change the way you look at God's love, your experience of God's love will also change. So I invite you to think about this idea that the love of God is perhaps more like a waterfall, waterfall than it is like a parent. When you hear the word Heavenly Father, 
God's love might really be. So I invite you to think about the limitless impact of God's love, the limitless presence of a waterfall, the luminous impact of God's love, and how that enlightenment can enrich our lives, and how that metaphor of a waterfall enlightens our thinking around God's love. So may the waterfall of God's love flow into your lives. And may you develop that personal connection with that waterfall. And may you be moved emotionally by that waterfall. But may you always understand to perceive that love in such a way that we don't attach our human qualities to that love. Because it paints us into a corner. So I offer those suggestions, knowing that this is difficult ground. Many of us have hung on to the image of God as some sort of being that is humanist. And I understand that. And it's a healthy image up to a point. But it creates a downside as well. So that is food for thought. And I guess as waterfalls go, I could say, may you flow in peace. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>